I lead you in the way you should go, Isaiah 48, 17. Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you to our King's Kids. We're glad to have you with us at Full Devotion FBC Canton this morning. To those on our online community, we extend a special welcome to you. It is the last Sunday in October. It is All Saints Day and we are celebrating here breast cancer awareness and supporting those within our church family who have or are currently going through a battle with Breast cancer, and so thank you for wearing pink this morning. Yeah, looking around and seeing all the different pink. And if you didn't have pink to wear today, there were some ribbons out there on your way in. Hopefully you found one of those and you can pin it to your shirt and you can support uh, those in our church that we're praying for, especially Melanie Campbell and the Campbell family uh, in this time for them. And if you're online with us, I expect you to be in your pink pajamas this morning. Let me share with you quickly a few great things that are happening here in the life of our church. It is tomorrow, November 1st, and so we have our November newsletter, The Trumpeter, for you to browse through and get yourself up to date on all those things that are happening as we approach the holidays of the 2021 season. Thanksgiving, three and a half weeks away, and Christmas to follow. If you've been out shopping, certainly you know that by the decor in the shopping stores. Today we have our normal activities tonight for our youth. Wednesday night we have a meal fellowship time with lasagna and chicken alfredo, chicken nuggets, salad, all those goodies. Come and be a part of that as we have restarted this ministry and it is $5 for adults, $3 for child. A family maximum cost is $20 and you can purchase your tickets today at the information table. Uh, Always contact the office and let us know that you're coming and so Good to have you join us for a meal on Wednesday night. Following that, we have our children's ministry and also our adult Bible study looking at the 23rd Psalm. Saturday, 9 a.m., to all of our men here in the church, we have our breakfast. You're invited to come. Breakfast will be provided. We are starting a new series that will take us through the seven months remaining in the school year. It's seven leadership characteristics of men, and I really hope, I really encourage you If you're a a guy, if you're a man, come and be a part of this. Put it on your your schedule. This is important for us as we grow in our relationship with God. So come and be a part of that. 
two weeks combined service at 11 o'clock a.m. on November 14th. Our youth, our Amplify youth on the direction of Davina will be leading us in worship. And so we want all of our church to come and support them on that Sunday. Those of you online, make it a priority to be with us and support Youth Sunday. Following that service, we'll have a congregational business meeting as we look at our budget for 2022 and our leadership teams. Also on that Sunday, a free movie. Sunday night, be reminded that the time change happens next weekend, so we'll fall back. It'll get dark very, very early. And so at 5.30 on the 14th, we'll be showing the movie Seven Days to Utopia. Now, how many of you have seen that movie? Raise your hand, nice and high. I'm the only one, it looks like. How many of you like golf? Anybody like golf? A few hands are going up. This is a great movie that focuses a little bit on golf, but focuses primarily on getting our priorities straight and a great message to share with all of you. So out on the information table, we have these half sheets that tell you all about the movie, and this is also an invitation tool. So you can hand this to somebody and say, hey, we'd like to invite you for a free movie. We have popcorn, candy, water. Everybody gets one of those as they come in, and we'll share together at 5.30. Hope you can be a part of that. Also on the information table, if you see this form, it means Christmas is near. Not quite near, but the deadline is for ordering poinsettias, November 21st. If you'd like to have one of those here, decorating the front of the sanctuary on the chancel, pick one of these forms up and fill that out. Turn it into the office by November 21st. Also, as we think through the things that are happening today, it is our last Sunday to focus on missions. This whole month has been a, quite a journey as we have shared together in our missions opportunities and our generosity project. So let me remind you that today is really the last opportunity to pick up one of those envelopes off the wall out there where we're building a house with hammers and nails. We were doing service projects with them and, and hoping to get some more done, but the weather has been difficult and your financial support has helped make all that happen. If you'd like to contribute to reaching our goal, you can do so today out there on the, on the wall. Pick up one of those envelopes, mark it, hammers and nails. But next week, the flags will be down, and we'll move on to the month of Thanksgiving. But before we do that, we have a lot to celebrate. We have a year to reflect upon, to look back upon, and to say thank you to our missions team I'm looking around to see who's here from our missions team this morning. Are you here with our missions team? Jodine's not back in here yet, but Cameron's back there. Raise your hand. Cameron, thank you. Carolyn was here at our first service. Uh, anybody else? Thank you so much for all that you help us accomplish. Thank you for your time, your efforts, your ideas. And each year, this is one of those times that I truly look forward to. I know Pastor Bob does as well. Thinking about the ways that we are the hands and feet of Jesus, that we impact our community, our state, our country, our world. And so today we have a recap video of the entire, the last year. You know, the ways that we have contributed to those mission organizations, those missionaries, and those opportunities where this church really extends out. Jodine's coming in here now, so we want to say thank you to Jodine as well for your missions team. I just gave that whole speech. You missed the whole thing, so you have to watch it. You have to watch it later. Um, anything else you want to add this morning? I don't think so, right? Pay close attention as we're going to show a video now that describes the many different ways that you all have been a part of making a difference for the kingdom of God, and I really Really appreciate it, and thank you to all of you. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it
Absolutely. A praise to God. A thanks to all of you. Approximately, and you can do the math if you want to watch the video again, $30,000 in that vicinity is an extension of you all to those who truly appreciate your support and you meet their financial needs. So thank you, thank you. You can continue to give. As you see, there are three ways to give in person, by mail, online. And we're going to ask God's blessing upon our offering this morning. Remember, you can drop that in the plate on your way in and on your way out. As well, think about those that will be lifting in prayer this morning. As we've mentioned, Melanie Campbell, also the McMillan family, Douglas, Robert and, Robin and Kathleen, our family of the week, Kathy, our missionary, Vicki, as she was in the hospital again this last week and praying for her healing cancer in her life, also Christina. And remember those missionaries from here in Ohio that are still in Haiti who have been kidnapped and being held for ransom. We don't want to forget uh, that they're in uh, quite a desperate situation and asking for God's protection over them. Let us go to the Lord in prayer as we join together this morning. Gracious and almighty God, you are the giver of all good things. You're the sustainer of life. All that we have can be attributed to you. Our lives, our time, our talent, our treasures. And Father, what a joy it is for me to be a part of a congregation of followers of Jesus who believe in the importance of giving, that we tithe off of our resources, our income, the offering that we receive. Lord, that goes out into all these different avenues that we have just witnessed to this morning, and it's incredible. It truly is fantastic. It's mind-blowing that we get to be a part of supporting so many wonderful people and wonderful organizations, and we could not do it without all of us combining our efforts together and giving and, and truly being generous. Yes, God, we believe you could do it all without us. You could do anything. You created the world in six days, but you invite us to be a part of the outreach of the hands and the feet of Jesus. And if that doesn't describe the importance of a community of church and fellowship and believers, I don't know what does, Lord. We are to be about your mission, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and empowering those who are doing it as well. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for our missions team. Thank you for everyone. 
Lord, as we lift up our prayer concerns to you today, as we intercede on the behalf of individuals in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, we ask for your protection around those missionaries in Haiti. Put a hedge of angels around them, Lord. Spare their lives. Change the hearts of their captors. Allow them to go free. Break those chains, even as you broke Paul's chains in prison, Lord. Father, as you heal, as you are the miracle worker, we lift up Melanie to you and Douglas and Robin and Kathleen. And I'm certain, Lord, there are others on our prayer list. We thank you for those who are here this morning for the very first time who haven't been here with us in a while because of hospitalization or COVID or whatever it may be. And Father, we're back together today and we're stronger together and we pray for healing among this body of believers and all who are part of it. Lord, we pray for Kathy. Ask you to encourage her, strengthen her faith, allow her to know how much we care for her. Lord, we lift up Vicki to you today, praying against her cancer and for a miracle in her life. And we lift up Christina to you and all those that we've celebrated this month in mission, all those that were on the video just a few moments ago. May you embolden them this morning. Let them know how important they are, how much we appreciate them, and may we continue to be faithful in our prayer support, in our financial support, and in our encouragement to each and every one of them. Now these gifts, which we lay at your feet, Lord, in your throne room, which we turn over to you, they're, nothing that we have is really ours. It's not ours to begin with, it's yours. And you entrust it to us for a period of time, and during this time, we want to be found faithful of returning back to you a portion of that, asking your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, it's, um, this next song has got some great words in it, and uh, these are the days of Elijah. It says that, uh, and though these are days of great trials, and the last year and a half, almost two years now, have been days of great trials, amen? And um, it's been tough, tough as a church, tough as a body of believers, as a family. But I want to just say one thing. This man sitting right down here has helped guide us through these times. He's been really working hard. He's done diligent research to make sure that we are safe. And this is, um, it's the last day of Pastor Appreciation Month. And um, we are blessed to have a man like Kevin Thomas leading us through this time. And um, if I might be so presumptuous, can we lift up a praise offering to God and thanks for him? And we are the laborers in your day. 
at home could see what I see up here. We've got people doing the motions and doing all sorts. It was like, I love that song. So much fun. Oh, praise you, Lord. Lord, I just, I, I love my calling. I love what you allow us to do on Sunday mornings. We come, we worship you, we have fun. Lord, you, you are glorious, Father. You are glorious, Lord. We thank you. Yes. Look inside that mystery. See the end.
Yes. He's glorious, amen. You know, there are um, songs that touch our hearts because of where we were when we first heard them. And uh, this is one of those new songs that was written 26 years ago. Um, uh, and the first time I heard this, I was at a Promise Keepers event. I don't know if you younger people would know what those Promise Keepers events were, but they were pretty remarkable. You'd go, and it was all men, and they were packed in Three River Stadium. Yeah, it was that back that far ago. And 40,000 men packed into Three River Stadium and singing, singing praises to God, promising that they would be the leaders of their houses, that they would be out there in the forefront, leading their homes in a, in a loving way. And this song came out of that in 1995, yes. And yeah, it's an old one. It's an old one. But this one really touches my heart big time. If he's not gonna play the piano, then tell him to get out of the recital. You know what I mean? Hold on one sec. Yeah, buddy, I gotta make this quick. Then may I recommend the instant demands? They're flash fried. Yeah, 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 I don't need the recipe. Just get it out here with a side of frazzled nerves and bring the check while you're at it. Absolutely. I needed the reports like yesterday. Hey, buddy, can you replace this one with one that's burnt above him? 
I've got to work late tonight, honey. Before we get into today's message, let me just take a moment and return the appreciation back to each and every one of you for your support and encouragement. It's not about me. It never should be about a church following a pastor or a person on staff, but only about following the Lord Jesus Christ. A thank you to Bob. And I will not lie. There have been more and more moments over the last 18 months where I felt it's just time to quit, just time to give up, it's time to find if there's something else uh, God is calling me do, to do in life. But in those moments, a card from you, a phone call, word of appreciation, God continues to direct my heart back to this calling and leading this congregation for as long as he keeps me here whatever that length of time may be. And I know it's not been easy for a lot of us, and yet together we're stronger, together we encourage one another, support one another. I don't know why we've never done this Pink Sunday before in the 21 years I've been here. This is the first time I can remember us saying, hey, let's support those that are fighting cancer, breast cancer specifically in our church and in our community. So thank you to everybody wearing pink today. Uh, you know, I need to ask the question more by, by no means am I perfect, absolutely not perfect. I mean, you all know I wrote for the, root for the Bengals, so um, I make mistakes. I look at the leaders throughout Scripture, and, and I don't think we can identify a single one other than Jesus. We look at Moses, we look at David, we look at Paul, we look at Peter. They were all human, just like me, and we make mistakes. We don't get it right all the time. Um, they didn't get it right all the time, and yet God continued to use, he continued to use them, and they tried to do their best, and, and I think that's what each and every one of us do, and just like, you know, you read some of those stories, and, and you know the people weren't always gracious, but there were people who were gracious, and forgave those mistakes, or those hiccups, those shortcomings, and, and hopefully I haven't murdered anybody like Moses. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, some of the other major mistakes that, that we see in Scripture. Uh, but I know I, I've made plenty. But just thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you for uh, your support, appreciation this month. Um, thank you to whoever gave me the Red Lobster gift card back on my birthday because I took my daughter out to eat for lunch this week. That was fun to do, uh, a gift that keeps on giving. Um, and also thank you for uh, really appreciating my request that you not do anything special during this month of this year because you've been so gracious to me the entire year. So um, plan ahead for next October. <laughs> when we get there, right? When we get there. Uh, I have a great staff to work with. It's a great team effort. Bob, Tawana, Davina, Lee, our ministry teams, all of you who come in and help out. Uh, I'm not going to lie. We need more help. We need more support more than ever to do the things that we need to do around here. Uh, so as I share this morning's message uh, of what God's laid on our hearts through this scripture, if you can be a part in any way, certainly appreciate it. Okay, we're going to look at the gospel of Luke chapter 10 here in just a few moments. And as we wrap up this four-week series entitled I Choose, the last four weeks we've been talking about very specific choices that Jason Herman is going to make. Just seeing if you're still with me, Jason. That all of us are going to make. When we look at what God is calling us to be, what God is calling us to do, these are very important, very specific choices. And I hope you've been with us every week. And if you haven't, go back and watch some of the previous weeks. They're online. They're always available. But essentially, we've been talking about this principle that we are the sum total of the decisions that we have made in the past. Otherwise, that determines who we are today and what we have done up until this point. And the decisions, the choices that we make today will determine who we are tomorrow and what we're able to accomplish in the future. Now today I want to introduce our fourth and our final choice that we're talking about. And I want to ask you, I want to invite you to do it. And let me ask this question. You can raise your hands and please keep them raised high. How many of you would say, or you have said at some point, 
I wish I had more time to do something that was important to me. I wish I had time to do some of those things that I never get to that are very important to me. Virtually all of us would raise our hands. All of us would say, absolutely, pastor. I wish I had more time to do to whatever, to do whatever. Maybe it's to rest. Amen? Maybe it's to spend more time with my kids or with my family or with my spouse. Maybe it's more time to reflect and to read the Bible. Maybe it's more time to garden. Maybe it's more time, more time to go fishing somewhere. I like that one. <laughs> but I wish I had more time. But if you're like most people, you'll say, I've got a yard to mow. I've got leaves to rake. I've got dishes to do. I've got bills to pay. I've got whatever that's on my plate right now and seems incredibly urgent to do, complete a work project, whatever it might be, raise my kids, get that right caption on my Facebook post or Instagram post with just the right filter. <laughs> I wish I had more time to do something, but I just don't have enough time. Think about for a moment, when often when you have a conversation with people and when you ask somebody, how are they doing? Or I've seen it when I've gone up to somebody and said, how are you? Or how are you doing? Now let's get past the fine answer, okay? Because that's the one a lot of us like to use. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be too real. And so we just say, I'm fine. But what's the answer that perhaps is number two behind fine? When you go up to someone and you say, how are you doing? What do you hear? Anybody have an idea where I'm going with this? Too scared to ask? What's that? You've been better. Adam, we know you've been better. How about this one? I'm busy, man. I'm way too busy. You just can't believe how much I have to accomplish right now. I am just so busy, busy, busy. Anybody ever noticed that? How you doing? I'm busy. <laughs> you know, just once. This will be fun for us. I think we should all do this this week to somebody just for the fun of it. And they come up to us and they say, how are you doing? How have you been? And just go, man, I am so relaxed. I'm so chill right now. Life has never been so easy. I don't want you to lie. <laughs> Tell them you don't have much going on. No, they would say that's probably a lie because all of us would say I'm just busy, busy, busy doing things that, by the way, may not really matter that much. This is what I believe we need to be working toward and where we're going with today's message. To be able to say I actually have the ability to choose what I'm going to spend my time doing. Think about it. We all... We all have the time to choose what we have the time for, do we not? Yes. Anytime I'm saying, I, I wish I had time to do something, means I'm choosing my time to do something else that doesn't allow me to do that something that I want to do. We all have time for what we choose to have time for. Now, when I was back in college, when I was back doing my classes for college, I remember this teacher that had this class, and he introduced us to this writing entitled The Tyranny of the Urgent. Anybody ever heard it? Anybody ever read about it? Tyranny of the Urgent, I see a few, few heads shaking. This might be something for you to go and research a little bit more. It was Charles Hummel who first used the term tyranny of the urgent in a pamphlet that was published in 1967. And here's what he said, I quote, the important task rarely must be done today or even this week. But the urgent task calls for instant action. The momentary appeal of these tasks seem irresistible and important, and they devour our energy. But in light of time's perspective, their deceptive prominence fades with a sense of loss we recall the vital task that we pushed aside and we realize that we've become slaves to the tyranny of the urgent. 
Now stay with me as we unpack this a little bit this morning because we often live our lives focused on what we see as urgent while some of these things might be important, but many things are not when it comes to what we see as urgent. And might I suggest, or might I give you this perspective that Charles Hummel wrote this over 50, what, 53, 54 years ago. Think about life then versus life now. Now, all of you know I was born in 1971. I remember growing up in my household, our TV had five channels at best. You know, ABC, NBC, CBS. Remember when Fox came along? And then there was the wonderful PBS station. Anybody else remember? TV only had like five channels. I see some hands going up. Kids are out there going, what? (laughs) You only had five channels and they weren't Boomerang, Cartoon Network, ESPN, whatever. But think about it today. We have what? Hundreds of channels to choose from on our television. You might say because of the internet and streaming, we have what? Thousands of channels that we can choose from. And we have social media and we have all of these, these messages coming at us telling us what is important, what is vital, what is urgent, and demanding our time and our attention. And we're constantly faced with things that call for action and consume us. They consume us. But are they really important? 1957 versus today, I would say the tyranny of the urgent has grown exponentially. I choose our decision today. As you can see in your bulletin outline on the screen in front of you, I encourage you to fill out the blanks as we move along here. I choose the important over the urgent. That's the decision we're making today. With God's help, he will empower us to choose what is important over what we see as urgent. Now, I can almost imagine what a lot of you are saying. Pastor, I thought that urgent things are important. (laughs) And yes, they can be, but urgent things are not always that important. There's a difference. And I'll give you a few examples here this morning so that we can identify importance over urgent. If you're a business owner and you have a customer who's upset or angry over something that has not happened when you're providing a service, dealing with that customer is urgent, right? Shake your heads. Write a note in your outline online, those of you who are with us. It's urgent, right? Absolutely. But how about being the business owner who understands the importance of creating systems so that customers are satisfied and will never get upset and angry? Otherwise, they've created an environment and a system to keep them from getting upset and angry. That's important, is it not? Or think about it in this terms. How many of you drive a vehicle? Yeah, when that vehicle breaks down because the oil is no longer good and you have to get it into the shop so that it can be fixed, that's incredibly urgent, is it not? But what if that happened because you didn't recognize the importance of the manufacturer's recommendation that you get the oil changed every three to 5,000 miles? And the reason that your car engine needed repaired is because you didn't do it. So changing that oil is important. Or how about, how about this one? You're really, really sick. And it's because you didn't take care of yourself. You didn't get enough sleep. You didn't get healthy food and and, and stuff into your body. You didn't exercise. And you didn't do all those things. You're overwhelmed way too much because you've been what? Busy. Busy, busy, busy. You're doing too much. So going to the doctor to seek treatment for being sick now becomes urgent. But wasn't it important all along to do those things that would what? Keep you from getting sick in the first place. So today, let's consider how we choose the important over the urgent. And the scripture gives us a tremendous example 
of what is important over what is urgent. We find it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It's the story of Martha and Mary, and many of you know this story, and if you've never heard it, today will be the first time that you've heard it. I don't know how God does some things sometimes, but I did not know this was going to coincide with our Pink Sunday, and I think the fact that we're looking at two women and we're looking at Mary this morning is incredibly, incredibly significant to us. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 38, 42. Read along with me on your Bible, on your app, on the screen in front of you. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary. Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha, she was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She was doing all those things that were required of her, the urgent tasks that she perceived to be necessary. So what happens? She comes to Jesus, and she asks him, and I think once again she's kind of stomping her feet as she does this, you know. Lord, don't you care that my sister, Mary, has left me to do all of this work by myself. And by the way, Jesus, do something about this. Tell her to help me. Doesn't she love that? Tell her to help me, Jesus. Martha, Martha. Say that with me. Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried, you are upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Martha, you're worried and upset about all of these urgent things, but few things are important or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. And we go back, circle back to verse 9, 39, and we say, what did Mary choose? She chose to sit and listen at the feet of Jesus. Now, both Mary and Martha loved Jesus. I have no doubt about that. Do you? They both loved Jesus. They couldn't believe that he was going to be in their home, that while he was traveling, he chose to stop there. Both of them, I know, wanted to show their honor and their devotion to Jesus. But Martha was focused on what needed to be done for Jesus, while Mary was focused on being with Jesus. Incredible difference. I mean, Martha was a kind and gracious host. In fact, I would say she's a great host. She's the same kind of host a lot of us will be in three and a half weeks when we're hosting Thanksgiving at our home and we're making sure that everything is tidy up, that the the carpets have been cleaned, the bathroom's all clean, the kitchen looks nice. Well, hopefully it looks nice after all the cooking. We want to make sure that all the food has been prepared, the table is set, everything looks perfect, right? Because we want to go about doing all those things for the people that come and spend time with us. We want it to be an incredibly special day. And Martha was a kind and gracious, great host for Jesus. And those are good things. She wanted everything to be perfect for his visit. But folks, all of those details distracted her from what is important, spending time with Jesus himself. Now, if you want to get out of hosting Thanksgiving dinner this year, use this passage and just tell your family, hey, we're ordering pizza, come over, we'll sit down and eat. Forget all that other stuff, because I just want to spend time with you. Might not work. Mary, on the other hand, Jesus said what? You've chosen what is better. You chose what was important, because Mary knew that Jesus wouldn't be around often, and she wanted every possible moment she could have to spend time with him so she could be in his presence. And she wanted to listen to Jesus. She wanted to learn from Jesus. She wanted to love Jesus. Mary chose what was important. You might say Mary chose what was important. Martha surrendered to what was urgent. 
And if we're not intentional about this, I promise you, without a doubt, I promise each and every one of you, the urgent will crowd out what is important in your life. It happens all the time. And Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better. So if we want to choose what is better, in your outline, if we want to choose what we're supposed to choose as important, and not just what is urgent, how do we choose what is better? So let me give you a few thoughts on how to choose what is better, what is important. The first thing is we need to identify what is most important. What are the most important things in our lives? Who are the most important people in our lives? What is most important in my life? And I've laid a a, a blank there for you in your outline. We've put a blank in there. What have you been distracted from pursuing which is most important to you? Hmm. Take, Take some time. Put something down there. Maybe one or two things. At least one. Don't try to list a whole bunch. What have you been distracted from pursuing that that you know you can identify as most important? And I hope that most of us would say those things that are important for us, our faith, our family, our friends, our health, our education and learning, we could list all those things, serving others, loving others as Jesus did. There might be other things for you to add to that list, things that you've identified as part of the purpose for your life, because remember, we're choosing purpose over popularity. But what is most important in your life? And when we identify that, then we have to choose to prioritize in our lives what is most important. We have to to take a good look at our time, our energy, our spending all those resources that we have, and say, if those things aren't contributing to what I've identified as most important, then I need to make some changes in my life. I need to make some different choices. If I'm going to do something that's on my list, then my focus, my energy, my resources, my time, my treasure have to be helping me accomplish that. So once we've identified what is most important in our lives and made that a priority and and identifying as a choice to pursue that, then secondly, this means do first what matters most, okay? Do it first. Whatever it is that matters most has to be first on your list. Remember, we have all the time that we need to choose what we have time for. If we say we have no time to read the Bible, we have no time to pray, and we spend all of our time that we do have watching TV, flipping through social media, watching movies, whatever it may be, the truth is we do have time to read our Bible and pray. We've just chosen to do something else, to consume our time and chosen not to read our Bible. If we say we don't have time to spend with our family, but we have time for outside activities and hobbies and all kinds of other stuff, then it means we've just not made our family a priority. If we choose what we have time for, and it's not what is most important to us, then guess what? You need to do what matters most first, right? Do first what matters most. And if we struggle to truly understand what matters most in life, because so many good things are good things, just like Martha, right? All the things that she was doing, those were good things. But often those good things consume our time, our attention, our priorities. Then let me suggest that first allow God to direct you, help you prioritize. This really isn't my suggestion. It's a biblical teaching in the gospel of Matthew verse 6 verse chapter 6 verse 33 the verse says but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well Matthew gives us a principle to live by in prioritizing where we spend the most time where we spend the most energy where we spend our most resources and he says seek first his kingdom And his righteousness. 
and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, I've been around the American church long enough now to know that we've flipped this around so many times, it's not even funny, right? But seek first all these things that we believe are urgent and necessary in our lives for living, and if you got a little time left over, then seek God, read your Bible, pray a little bit, go to church, be a part of a fellowship group, a group study, whatever it may be. If you've got a little time left, then do those things. No, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know, it's also the example that Jesus gave us. Even Jesus had to choose what was important over what was urgent, and it wasn't always easy because the urgent was always going to be there. There were urgent things for Jesus to do, like healing the sick and performing miracles. But Jesus had to decide if he was going to give his life as a ransom for many versus what was urgent or what people wanted from him. He chose what was important. And you know, this choice in Jesus' life was, was a profound one that comes at the beginning of his ministry because once he started healing people and word got out, there was no containing it. People were coming from every nook and cranny to see if Jesus could perform a miracle for them, if Jesus could heal them. You can read about them in the scriptures, all these different accounts. And obviously that was urgent and it was an important task for him to be able to do. But what was most important for him. He had to decide what his focus was going to be, and his focus was what was best. And the priority and the purpose of his life to share the good news of the gospel to share that he had come to forgive the world of their sins, not just heal them physically, but to heal them spiritually for all of eternity. You can read about this in Mark chapter 1, in Mark's gospel. Because we see this passage of scripture where it says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And after that time of prayer, you, you can see that Jesus changed his focus and his priorities. He chose what was important over what was urgent. Because Jesus didn't allow the crowds of people, people to dictate or tell him what was important. He did first what mattered most, and that was preaching the good news of God. And where did he get that direction? He turned to God in prayer. So if you and I, if we're wrestling with what is most important in our life, if we're wrestling to try to figure out what God desires for us and the direction that we need, you know, then we need to turn to God. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Jesus also said, you worry too much about things like what you wear and the food that you will eat and all of those things, your jobs and whatever else, when you should seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek God first and allow God to show you what you need, to give you what you need, to help you focus on where you spend your time, your energy, and your resources. You see, Jesus just isn't teaching a good teaching here. He's sharing his own experience with us. And that's how Jesus lived, and that's how his choices were made. And when we choose what is important, when we identify what is most important, and then we take the next step to do first what is most important, the third thing that I share with each and every one of you that I struggle with, number three is that we learned when to say no. Church, we absolutely have to learn when to say no to those things which seem urgent in our life, seem urgent for our family, seem urgent for our kids. We have to learn when to say no to what is urgent and at times what might even seem important. You know, when Jesus said that he was going to go to other villages to teach and to preach and to, and to tell them about the good news, he was saying what? I'm not going to be known primarily as a healer as a miracle worker. Yeah, he still healed people, and he still performed miracles, but it wasn't going to be the focus of his life. There are times when you and I have to say no to good things. But we do that so that we can experience and give ourselves the things that are better. 
Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better. Oswald Chambers, many of you know this author. He said this, and I quote, Good is always the enemy of the best. Good is always the enemy of the best. When we end up choosing what is urgent and good, we often never get to what is important and best. So we have to learn when to say yes, and we have to learn when to say no. And in fact, I would argue with all of my heart that most people today, the barrier to getting what is best, the barrier to having a meaningful life is not a lack of commitment. It's an overcommitment in our lives today. Let me say that again. For most people, the barrier to having a meaningful life is not that you're not committed. It's that you're way too committed. And you're doing way, 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 way too much. And so then you're telling everybody what? I'm way too busy. I'm just so busy, 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 busy. How have you been? Busy? How have you been? Overwhelmed? Understand this. Busyness does not necessarily equal productivity. Busyness does not necessarily equal meaning. And busyness does not necessarily necessarily equal fulfillment in this life. And most people, like me, instead of adding more to our to-do list, it would benefit us to start a to-don't list. These are the things I'm not going to do anymore. I'm not going to do them. If you want to have a more meaningful life, I would encourage you, say no to more. And say yes to more of what matters most. So what are we going to do to choose the important over the urgent? Identify what is most important. Do first what matters most and learn when to say no. Mary has chosen what is better, Jesus said, and it will not be taken away from her. Listen, you have a choice. We all have a choice. You have time to do what you choose the time to do. You have the time to choose what you have the time for. You can make excuses or you can make progress, but you can't make both. And if you choose that which is most important, then you know what? There won't be as many things that you think are urgent. But the opposite is never true, absolutely never true. Martha was distracted by urgent things. Mary chose what was most important. And that's why with the help of Jesus, you and I are going to choose every single day that which is important over that which is urgent. And with the help of God, we can do that. We've looked at four important, four important choices over the last four weeks. Purpose over popularity Surrender over control, discipline over regret, and important over urgent. And you know, learning to make these choices is a daily commitment, and we have to consider them at crucial times in our lives to make the right choice to live like Jesus. Because that's how Jesus lived. And if we're going to grow in full devotion to Jesus, we have to live like Jesus lived. Father, I pray in this moment, as we have concluded this series, this study, as followers of Jesus, we want to experience the fullness of the life that you have offered us and the faith that you have given us, and we want to experience life eternal. And I'm always reminding myself that that life eternal, eternity with Jesus, does not begin at that moment somewhere in the distant future where we die and go to heaven. It begins now as we're living and surrendering our lives to Jesus and understanding what he desires for us and making the choices that, God, you would desire for us and being obedient to you. And the world is always coming at us with different things. and and making us think all these urgent things are important. But like Mary, can we choose what is better? Can we make choices? Can we be led by you in your direction to redefine how we live our lives with the purpose and the intent 
of you guiding us to what is most important, that which lives on for eternity, an eternal difference in your eternal kingdom that begins now in the eternal eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. And what it requires of each and every one of us here is to say, God, I no longer want to be in control of my life. I want to surrender control to you. I recognize that I have sinned, that I've made mistakes, that, that in order for me, Father, to be where you want me to be, I confess those sins to you and I ask you to forgive me And then I ask you to be Lord of my life. Do we understand what it means to ask Jesus to be Lord? That means not my will be done, but your will be done, God, in my life. Each and every one of us must make that decision. Each and every one of us must then surrender our life to God and allow him to guide and direct us until that moment when he calls us home, making choices that he would want us to make. God, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for their hearts. I pray for each and every person's salvation. Making that decision, surrendering to you is what we call being saved. It's salvation from you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's that recognition that all of us must make living our lives, surrendering to you so that the things that we choose are those things that are most important to us and to you. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and everything else will be given to you as well. I pray this in the power and the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As I always like to say, go out and live it. Folks, that's the challenge, the message that God has given us. Choose the important over the urgent. Thanks for being with us.